Glory to Jesus Christ. So today is the 12th of August in the memorable year 2020. And today is the Feast of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. And let's say a prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, she was, she lived from 1572 to 1641. She married the Baron de Chantal and had six children. As for her husband's death, she dedicated her herself to the sick and the poor. She met St. Francis de Sales, Francois de Sales, and she founded with him the Order of the Visitation under his guidance. She later published his writings. Let us pray. O God, who made St. Jane Francis de Chantal, radiant with outstanding merits in different walks of life, grant us, through her intercession, that walking faithfully in our vocation, we may constantly be examples of shining light to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And our prayer of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we're on Thirsting for Prayer by Father Jacques Philippe. And that's published by Scepter Press in 2014 and we're on page for those uh, reading along page 125 number eight toward continual prayer now let us consider a path of access to contemplative prayer different from meditation on scripture not opposed to it but complementary I mean the various traditions of repetitive prayer, such as the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, or variants of that, or just the name of Jesus, various things, or prayer of the heart, and the rosary. They have the advantage of being simple and able to be used during the time of prayer and also outside it, so that prayer can little by little fill the whole of our lives. I have made this point before, but I would like to come back to it now. Believers have always sought continual prayer. From Old Testament times, we have this aspiration. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Psalm 1, verse 2. Oh, how I love Thy law, it is my meditation all the day. Psalms, Psalm 119, 97. It is still more evident to the Christian world, where many people have chosen to respond to the Lord's call, pray without ceasing. See 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Christians cannot be content with having regular set times of prayer. We should seek to pray constantly, to be always in a state of union with God, of love and adoration. Because here is where we find our true life. God does not stop loving us and thinking about us, so it is right that we should want to do the same for him and live permanently in his presence. Walk before me, he asked our father Abraham in Genesis 17.1. It is good to think about God as often as possible to love and adore him ceaselessly in our hearts. 
I really believe that I have never gone for more than three minutes without thinking about God, said St. Therese of Lisieux. We should desire to achieve a sort of continual attention of the heart to God's presence in the middle of our ordinary occupations. That is not easy because we are so distracted. It is a long-term task, requiring a particular sort of assistance from God's grace. We will never achieve it perfectly, but it is good to aim for it, since that is where true happiness is to be found. This is how Father Mata El Maschine describes the converging efforts to be made with this aim in mind. Uh, Father uh, Mata, who is a mass who I believe in Coptic, is a Coptic Egyptian Orthodox uh, monk. I believe he's now deceased. But I believe he was from Luxor. And uh, uh, he gave these wonderful meditations on, on scripture and, and on prayer. And I believe a number of his books are in English. Uh, the uh, L'Experience de Dieu dans la vie de prière is noted by Father Jacques Philippe. Uh, but, uh, I don't know if that's in English. If it were English, probably they would have had the, the English title for it, The Experience of God in the Life of Prayer. This is how Father Mata El Maschine describes the converging efforts to be made with this aim in mind. Stir up our sense of being in the presence of God, who sees everything we do and hears everything we say. Try to talk to him from time to time with short phrases that express what we feel at that moment. Involve God in our work by asking him to be present in our activities, reporting back to him when we finish them, thanking him when we succeed, and telling him we are sorry when we fail, while seeking the reasons. Did we turn our back on him or neglect to ask for his help. So uh, talking to the Lord, to just talk to God the way you talk to other people or the way you talk to yourself. And don't deny it, most of you do. I call, just call it thinking out loud and I seem to need it more and more the older I get as uh, trying to clarify what I, and to remember what I'm about to do. But just converse. Converse about anything. doesn't have to be profound. It could just talk to God about anything, anything that comes into your head. Short phrases that express what we feel at that moment. You could often say, oh, Lord, I'm tired. Oh, Lord, I'm so upset with this person or something. Or, or Lord, uh, I am so happy. Uh, especially because I'm in you, I'm united with you. Or, or, or Lord, just bless this person. And sometimes we could say it in, like they say in the southern parts of the United States. Bless your heart, uh, which is not necessarily a compliment. Uh, so it's a, a pious way of saying uh, something that uh, one could say imp impiously. But, uh, but that's a, a wonderful thing to call God's blessing on people who annoy us or on people who hurt us, on, on all sorts of people. And stir up our sense of being in the presence of God who sees everything we do and hears everything we say. And just in the middle of anything, you could just to realize, oh, God is here. You're here, Lord. I mean, I'm in your presence. And your presence pervades everything. Involve God in our work by asking him to be present in our activities, or reporting back to him when we finish. So, and it's a good thing uh, every day to have a sort of review of life in which you can break it up throughout the day, just talk to God about what you've been doing or, or, or what
what you've been feeling, what you've been going through. And especially do this in an attitude of thanksgiving, even if it's painful, even say, oh, when we reflect on that and we examine our conscience, we, we see uh, faults and even sins. But then, you know, instantly show repentance and say an act of contrition. It doesn't have to be a formal act of contrition. It can just be something very, very brief. And, uh, and then resolve to deal with the sin or the repercussions of the sin or, or our faults. And, and when we do this, we should ne not be discouraged. This is not an exercise in beating yourself. It's an exercise in communicating with God. And it's an exercise in knowing yourself. So and we want to see ourselves through the eyes of God, the loving eyes of God. But the all, all holy and uh, all just eyes of God as well. So thank him when we succeed and in thank him when we fail. Thank him for everything. Saying, God, I know you can use this. Whatever it is, whatever happened, I, know, I just turn this over to you. And throughout the day, turn things over to God, especially things that bother you, things that burden you, things that, you know, come back. Maybe a thought from the past, someone had done something to you in the past, and maybe you haven't seen this person in so long, and then you see this person, and it all comes back fresh and, and, and uh, as a panorama. In, in technicolor back to you but turn that over to the Lord just turn turn over the past is the past and uh, we can only deal with the past in the present and, and uh, ways of healing we can't uh, you know make the past better because it's it's done nor should we fret about the future because that's not going to help worrying doesn't help a plan, plan for the future, but that may not happen. You may not be here to do it, or things may change so radically that you're not going to uh, do that. So I was planning on this pilgrimage to Malta, St. Paul pilgrimage to Malta, uh, with a priest friend of mine. We're going to stay at a seminary, we're going to go to these churches, we're going to do all these things, pray this, that. And we were going to do a St. Catherine of Siena pilgrimage, go to Rome, go to Siena, and also while we're there, St. Dominic, uh, go to the tomb of St. Dominic in Bologna. But all that fell apart with this corona. That's that. Then I was, we were going to go on a pilgrimage to Washington. So, so we'll go, we'll drive down to Washington. Um, so we'll go to the National Shrine, which I haven't been to in a long time. Even when I went on the marches for life, I just never had the time to, to go to that. So go to the National Cathedral, go to the National Shrine, go to St. Matthew's, go to the, oh, the, oh, the, or, or the Orthodox Church in America Cathedral, go to the Greek Cathedral, uh, go to these other things. And that's, that's out, too. And then all sorts of things that I planned for, that's just that. So plans can change instantly from uh, outer circumstances or, or, inner, or inner situations. So and just put everything in the Lord's hands. Not just put the thing in the hands and say, Lord, uh, I want you, I want this to be done. I want you to bless it and I want you to get this done as soon as possible. Rather, I should, our attitude should be, Lord, I put this in your hand. Bless this if it is according to your will. And if it's not according to your will, then let your will be done. And uh, let me know the grace of thanksgiving in, in the midst of whatever's going to happen. So in repentance, repentance is part of this review of life, this daily review of life, but it always has to be in, uh, in the line of thanksgiving as we look at our day. Did I neglect to ask for his help? So often, uh, that we don't often bring God into things, but to bring God into everything. I had a friend one time who said to me, do you have to drag God into everything? I said, no, he's already there. So it, it doesn't mean we have to, you know, constantly talk about God and nothing else. 
because, you know, talking about everything else is, in a sense, talking about God, that's his creation. And, uh, but to cultivate this awareness, practice this presence of God in everything, and whatever you're doing, do all for uh, his praise, do all for even the little things, the, the smallest thing, doing it for God. So that will help us avoid doing things we know are wrong, doing things we know are bad. Because we're doing it for God, knowing God sees that often helps. I remember as a child, that really hit me when, that God saw everything. When I looked at a dollar bill, and you know the pyramid in the back and the eye, and I knew that was the eye of God, and God was the all-seeing eye. That he was, he was there. The all-hearing ear. Uh, we had a little uh, poster that my older sister painted my sister uh, Margaret painted one time, and um, it said, uh, uh, "Christ is the head of this house, the unseen guest at every meal, the unheard listener to every conversation." And uh, that really hit me. Uh, not, you know, then this was when I was really little, but uh, later on that that that's the case that he said everything. So there's a, a, a Quaker tradition to have an empty chair at the, the dinner table to remind you that Jesus is there with you. <laughs> uh, a Baptist uh, friend of mine, a minister, uh, he uh, used to do that. He had have the chair, the, the, uh, the chair which was the minister's chair in the other the stage they had there. Uh, he had that, but then he'd pull up a chair and put it right by his pulpit there, his, uh, there, that uh, said, you know, that, that uh, the Lord was there. And often at the prayer time, he'd turn to the prayer, the, when he'd do the pastoral prayer, he'd turn to the chair, uh, reminding Jesus, the way, you know, we would, in the Catholic tradition, turn to the crucifix or the icon or turn to the tabernacle, especially Jesus truly presents there. But Jesus is at everything. He's with us all the time. I remember I was in the eighth grade and I went to this uh, softball game. Now I was not someone that was sought after to be on your team when it came to, to baseball. I was a klutz. I did so they all and I you know I never hit the ball it was just so they have to say you take him you take him it was always a humiliation and so I remember one time we went down uh, to uh, uh, Somerville Ave there and uh, near the Greek church uh, we had uh, there was this baseball game so I went the softball and they said, oh, you have, and so they, they said, one team had to take me. So they, I was stuck out way out in left field. And then I was thinking, it was a beautiful day. The grass was green, everything. And I was thinking, God is here. You're here with me. So I started to uh, softly uh, sing the rosary in that, uh, yes, I was a weird child. And uh, uh, way off in the back, and I still remember that. That the real sense of the of the presence of God. There's a hymn, This is my father's world, and to my listening ear, all nature sings and round me rings. The music of the spheres. The music of the spheres was a uh, a, a book, a common belief in uh, the classical period and in, in the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, that there were these. Uh, crystal spheres that the planets somehow were attached to and they would be moving around and that the stars and stuff were all attached to these crystal spheres and the, the music of it so the, the, the movement of it uh, instead of just being a squeak was with this, this beautiful music somehow or other this symphony this divine symphony and that of course they're out you know because it's meteorites came through they'd smash their crystal spheres uh, anyway but uh, 
practice the presence of God, stir up the sense of being in the presence of God, who sees everything we do and hears everything we say. And you know, try to hear God's voice through the work we do, you know, what we're doing, because we're doing it for God. At crisis moments, such as when we receive alarming news or when we are attacked, this could be uh, attacked by other people, uh, verbally or in some other, other way, or it, we could be attacked by the demonic, or we could be attacked by our own inner thoughts for that. Let us also ask him to help us in trials. He is our closest friend and surest advisor. So Jesus told us, don't worry about what to say when you're uh, dragged before the court because of being a Christian. And as the saying goes, if being a Christian were a crime, would there be enough evidence to have you convicted? He's our closest friend and our surest advisor. But he said, uh, do not worry about to say the Holy Spirit will speak up for you. Not that we shouldn't prepare for all sorts of things, of course. The moment we begin to feel irritated or upset, let us turn to him to calm this harmful agitation before it pervades our heart. So that's really to, to, to you, know, uh, you know, watch your tongue, as St. James tells us in the Epistle of James. Because, you know, when, if we could just say something hurtful that we say in anger at that moment without thinking, we should really try to think before we speak. And also, you know, in, in situations like that, so often it's better not to say anything at all. So there were many situations in my life in which I was completely silent at, in, in verbal attacks and insults and all sorts of things like that. And for the most part, I don't regret that at all. I probably would have regretted if I, I spoke up and then got into a quarrel with the, the person. And often, you know, you're not going to convince somebody who doesn't want to be convinced and when it comes to emotional issues, and especially if it comes to you, you know. So uh, nobody has to like me. That's and I don't have to like anybody, either. I do. I like most people, but uh, but I do have to love everybody, which is a different thing. This is not just a, an issue of of storge. That's a Greek word that means. Uh, that you uh, really like something, and almost as a thing, uh, and it, it's and the same thing with uh, your acquaintances and people, that uh, we may not like everybody, but we have to love them with the agape, the love that God is, and applying that in charity, uh, unselfishly. So before. The harmful agitation pervades our heart to, to get that initial. This isn't uh, burying your feelings. You know, we should feel our feelings. We should all that. But this is about expressing them because it may not be helpful at that time. So he mentions uh, these feelings. Envy, anger, judgment, which is more than a feeling, which is... Uh, a, you know, an act of the will, revenge again, so that's it. So uh, we live in a world that, uh, that spins on revenge. It just goes on, and, and often unjustified revenge. You know. And then the, this downward cycle of vendetta goes down more and more and more. All this would make us lose the grace of living in his presence. For God cannot dwell together with evil, especially grave evil. So uh, grave sin against that we, we evict God from our lives with grave sin, mortal sin. Yes, and God is uh, sovereign. God is all-powerful, all that. But God submits to that. 
the, the great humility of God, the great humility of God shown, especially in the incarnation, he's become one of us. But he is willing to back off from us or in get out if we tell him to get out of our lives. Why? Because God is love. And love can only be given freely, only can be received freely. Try as much as we can not to forget him. Returning to him the moment we realize our thoughts are wandering. And uh, often, you know, if you get, in, when you're trying to meditate or something like that, and you just can't get particular thoughts out, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about the sinful thoughts, mind you, but or, or uh, erotic thoughts, uh, concupiscible appetites, things, because... You know, the more you think about it, such a thing, the more power you give, give to them. But everything else. So a pray about that. A pray that if something keeps coming up and you keep pushing it down, maybe God wants you to deal with this now. Maybe God wants you to, to pray about this now, or whatever it is. So, so in a sense, pray your distractions if you can. Because often you can spend your whole uh, time, your whole meditation time, in fighting off distractions instead of, you know, conversing with God. Converse with God about the distraction. All that stuff. What they do. Or say, you know, the, uh, you can hear a jackhammer in the, in the background. Just, oh, that's very irritating. But then you say, well, Lord, I just pray for those people who are doing that now. But I also pray that you could take the, the jackhammer of the spirit to the hardness of my heart or to these difficulties in my life and break through or something. There are all sorts of things you can do. Or if you're really angry with somebody, pray for that person. Pray about that. And I often find what's helpful is sometimes to think of that person as a hurt child, a little hurt child, you know, emotionally hurt, who's crying there or something like that. So that's harder to... Uh, be angry in that situation. That not that anger. That not that all anger isn't sent by God. Some some of it can be for us to deal with. It can be an energizer to deal with issues. It can be uh, uh, we should be angry when we see evils done to people. When we see murder and cruelty. When we, we see the oppression of, of the weak, we should be angry about that. But we should not be enraged. So, and as scripture tells us, do not let the sun go down in your anger. So, uh, we, you know, so it's something that often needs to be dealt with, in a sense, interior at least, right away. We may not be able to go to the person and talk about it, because that sometimes will be counterproductive, because then... Uh, we explode or something, we say things. And you know, once you said something, it said, you, you know, you can forgive something someone said to you, but you can't forget it easily. And it changes, it can change relationships. So, uh, so we need to be careful about what we are, are up to. Try as much not to forget him, returning to him the moment we realize our thoughts have wandered. So let our wandering thoughts wander right up to him. Do not undertake a piece of work or give an answer before God, receiving God's encouragement. So pray about things. Sometimes, you know, that's a, a nice way of saying, so you know, sometimes we say, oh, will you, uh, 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 would you get involved with this? And you say, I'll pray about it, which is the devout person's way of saying uh, no, usually, or I'm going to shelve that for a long time. Uh, but uh, we should be praying about the things of making decisions to, it's, so that they may be part of the, uh, the, the will of God. Let us not undertake a piece of work or give an answer before re receiving God's encouragement. That is something that becomes more and more discernible the more faithful we are to walking in his presence and the more determined we are to live with him. 
So that's from uh, the same work uh, referred to before by uh, Father Matthew there. Uh, L'experience de Dieu dans la vie de prière. So that the experience of God in a life of prayer. So I'm going to look that up and see if it's in English. And so, uh, nine, repetitive prayers. Besides all that has just been said, one means used to foster continual prayer, especially by religious, is to repeat short phrases, often taken from or inspired by scripture. So that can be just a, 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 a oh God be merciful to me, a sinner. Or, or here, as St. John Passion noted, he would say often, Oh God, make hate, oh God, come to my assistance. Oh Lord, make haste to help me. Uh, from Psalm 71, which is a beginning of the uh, uh, many offices in, the, in, in prayer, prayer offices. <clears throat> this is done either during the time devoted to prayer or outside it during other activities, to keep God always in mind. According to John Cashin, certain monks in Egypt in the 4th century used to repeat the following invocation ceaselessly, O oh God, make haste to my rescue, Lord, come to my aid. The beautiful book, The Way of a Pilgrim, and the pilgrim continues his way, which is another later volume that we put together, uh, so there are a, a number of translations of that and editions of that. And uh, Father Philippe uh, refers to the way of a pilgrim and the pilgrim continues his way, translated by Helen Bakovchin. Uh, New York Image Books, 1985. So there are, uh, as I said, there are different editions, there are different translations of that around. And it's about this guy, or this, this Russian peasant, who uh, goes through a lot of, of uh, things, even disasters. You know, his wife dies, his, uh, I think his uh, inn is burnt down or something happens, stuff like that. Uh, his brother uh, was doing all this stuff, but rather than get back at his brother, he feels called to be a a wandering uh, ascetic, uh, devoting himself completely to prayer, especially to this Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this is before the Russian Revolution. This is in the 19th century sometime. And uh, there were those who think that he's, a, a fictional character, uh, but uh, anyway, he his thing is to go as a pilgrim uh, from place to place, a particular uh, sh different shrines and and before the communist persecution and uh, iconoclasm there, there were uh, shrines all over the place, and so it would go you know including village churches and stuff. There were often big pilgrimage centers like. Uh, Zagorsk, so so many other places, monasteries, all over the place uh, to go to, and so that's what he did. And he would do uh, this, but and, and accompanied by Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And there are different, as I said, different ways. It can just be the name of Jesus, breathing in and out, uh, Jesus, or something like that. Jesus. Or, or there are different ways of doing this. And there are longer versions, you know, through the prayers of the Mother of God, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. So there, there are all different ways of doing this. Uh, and some say us sinners. And, that, and some just have it, Jesus mercy. Jesus mercy. There are all different ways of doing this. And uh, you can sing it. There are different tunes to it. You can enchant it. There are all sorts of, of ways of doing it. And you can do it in different languages. 
But sometimes the, the, the music is set to its particular language, like uh, Stereoslav or Slavonic, or Greek, or uh, Arabic, or something like that. Um, there's Ukrainian one, that is a short one, but in English, I can do the whole, using that tune, I can do the whole Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and Virgin Mary Sinner, and even repeat uh, Jesus' name twice in that, with that particular tune. And there are other ways of, uh, there are all sorts of ways of doing this. And you can use a chart key, or a, I forget what the Greek name for this is. The Greek name is a lot longer. And this one was made by Brother Seraphim at my monastery, Holy Transfiguration Monastery, Mount Samauteba, Redwood Valley, California, up in Mendocino County. And he did this, it's acrylic, and he made it very quickly. It has these little beads in it. This is a hundred. So they have them that are 10. They have them that are 33 for the life of Christ. They have ones that are 100. They even have ones that are 500. So uh, I guess you just have to wear that as a belt, a 500 one. But uh, it, it, so so some people do that, you know, for as the round they, to do uh, uh, 100. Now, you don't have to count it because that can be distracting. But the, the the tactile thing of this can, can is often very helpful. I find the same with the rosary. Doing that sometimes I'll say Jesus mercy with the rosary, or Kitty Eleison or something, and just go bead by bead, not even really counting, but the the the, the feel of it, the tactile thing. Uh, use all your senses uh, in prayer. Uh, you know, it's good. I encourage people to have. Often you know, have an icon or a cross or, or, or to look at during these things, uh, but not you don't need that. That this isn't necessary either. But these can be helpful. These things can be helpful. This is part of our habit. A, a lot wear them on their wrists, which I was, and especially the ones with the tassel that I found that. Impractical because you were dipping the tassel into everything, uh, all that into the, into the, uh, the guacamole or whatever that's in. Uh, but uh, but uh, many do that. They wrap it on their their left wrist. Uh, I've even seen people with two, one on the right and one on the left, uh, with that. So and you can have these little, little tiny things. Same thing with rosaries. They have little rosaries that are one decade things. Even these little rings with these little bumps on them that make me think now of the COVID virus. Uh, uh, they have those, and there are a little, you know, single decade things. So uh, often what I would do if a rosary would break, I would uh, do uh, cut the decades, cut the decades. You couldn't get them all, all in the ten because uh, you could get the ten, but you couldn't always get the. Uh, the, the bead for the Our Father and the Glory Be, because, uh, but often I do that and have those. And those were useful in doing the rosary and other things, because you could be in a shop or something and you could just hold it in your hand and no one will notice uh, if, if it is, unless it's some really flashy color or something. But uh, there are all sorts of ways of doing this. So this beautiful book, The Way of, the Pil of a Pilgrim, Spread the knowledge and practice of the Jesus prayer or prayer of the heart. Well, this actually is only one of the prayers of the heart, uh, really, in, that, in the Western world. It tells of a humble Russian peasant who was moved by the exhortation. He actually may have been Ukrainian, I think. Uh, in the letter to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5, 17. And wondered how he could put this command into practice. He traveled through Russia in search of a spiritual father who could teach him. A monk initiated him into the tradition of prayer that consists of ceaselessly repeating, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, using a simple rosary of knotted woolen thread and coordinating the recital of the prayer with the rhythm of one's breathing while looking into one's heart. Little by little, the peasant experienced the benefits. His heart was filled with peace and purified. He felt the joy of God's presence. He received inner enlightenment about God's love. 
developed compassion towards everyone and saw the world and nature with new eyes. This tradition goes back to the Egyptian monasticism of the first centuries and spread throughout Orthodox Christianity. In our days, it is also spreading through the Western world. More familiar to Western Catholics is the devotion of the Rosary, with its constant repetition of Our Father and Hail Mary. Today, simple repetition does not always get good press. Ours is a world that, having lost its sense of the most fundamental things in life, is permanently in search of novelty. Now, it is true that repetition can become merely mechanical and routine, but it can also mean that love is being inscribed on the soul for as long as it continues. It is an intrinsic part of life. We are lucky our hearts don't get tired of constantly beating and our breathing does not get tired of its rhythm. And another practice of repeating these short things could be from you know a Bible verse, and you could take that, open your Bible, and read a bit, and then until something hits you, some little phrase that hit, hit you. So this phrase, I just opened the Bible up. It's Romans 2, and and uh, Romans 2, and the verses are so small here, 4, 4b. Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So you could take your rosary, or your chalky, or a chaplet, whatever, and just say that slowly, you know, read that slowly, and then, uh, then after you've said it enough, you don't have to read it, you have it. And just say that slowly, say that verse, whatever the verse is, or part of it. It has to be fairly short, fairly short verse, uh, for me anyway, such a thing too. So, do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So if you get into a rhythm of it too, in a breathing rhythm of that. So that's, you know, that's a practice too that you can do uh, with that. And of course, there are people who attack uh, this uh, and anything, repetition, they say, Oh, uh, Jesus said you're not supposed to repeat prayer. And I would say, no, oh, he didn't say that. He warned us about vain or empty repetition, like the pagans do. So which would be, you'd be saying this thing to sort of mesmerize the God that you were going to, uh, rather than mesmerizing yourself with this. So, um, or as if God, you know, it's the same thing with uh, many flowery words and stuff. God isn't, it, it, Jesus isn't opposed to that. He did that. He pra prayed in the synagogue. He prayed the Psalms that had repetitive things. The angels in uh, the book of Revelation are saying repeated things over and over. In, in Isaiah, they say, holy, 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 all this. There's a lot of repetition. And even Jesus repeats things. He prays and then he repeats it. Uh, and, uh, the healing, I believe that's the healing of the one of the blind men, and stuff like that. So the, the problem isn't repetition, it's vain. It's uh, sort of prayer wheel sort of, sort of thing, which actually doesn't necessarily have to be vain. Because even just swinging this, this thing in the Tibetan devotion, that could be uh, meaningful, it can be very meaningful. So, uh, but of course as Christians, we're, we're going to be praying uh, Christ compatible prayers. And so, uh, so we're reading it. So there, that a, a siren just went by. That's another thing, you know, all the sounds around can remind us to pray for that person. Lord, we just pray for the, the who's ever going to them, the EMTs, the police or whoever, and we pray for this circumstance. We pray for the person they're going to. So there are all sorts of things. Uh, that you can have with that. So, uh, repeated prayer.
it is permanently in search of novelty, our, our world, and also permanently in, in pursuit of amusement and even distraction. Well, that there, there's nothing wrong with amusement per se, but it can't be the center of your life. Uh, to be amused by everything, that's a gift. That's good. But uh, uh, and especially in worship, some people get the thing that it, the worship has to be totally entertaining to them. Uh, but that's not the case. It has to be totally entertaining to God. So, uh, so that, and of course, the beautiful music, beautiful art, uh, uh, graceful motion, whatever, all of those things can help in prayer. The aesthetic can, can be really helpful in prayer. So I always prefer to, to pray in a beautiful church. I prefer to see the priest dressed in beautiful vestments. I prefer the music to be beautiful, uh, which of course is subjective in many ways. Uh, that's that. Although uh, things, there's music that I don't find beautiful, but can be lively and stirring, uh, and you know that's that you know it's a, a tune you can dance to or whatever. But uh, uh, I prefer the beautiful myself. And as I said, it's subjective. Some people would think you know. Uh, uh, all of these things are beautiful. Or this, so, so some would think I have this order vacui, this horror of, of empty, the empty walls and stuff. So I just fill things. So some people would think that's just cluttered. Because I have things people give me, and I, I often display them where they can be displayed. And, uh, but I really like that. I really like in prayer and in everything. Uh, and, uh, in every room, I have something in my my uh, set of rooms. Everywhere I look, there is an icon, a crucifix, or something to remind me that God, this, this belongs to God, and God is here, and we have all of these things around. And also the saints, our family, reminds me as a child. On the wall, we had pictures of relatives, but then there were pictures of saints. There was Saint Therese. There was. We even had a picture of Pope Pius the Twelfth. I remember. We had a picture of John the Twenty Third with Cardinal Cushion. I remember we had that. But we, there were pictures of saints. And early on, I it it I just said, well, the saints are part of our family. And I'm part of their family. They're here. So. So we're per in the set of search of novelty, but the tried and true, there's nothing, uh, there's often nothing better than that. So we should be, uh, cherish the old and welcome the new, but test everything in these things and make sure that, that uh, if it's in an area of prayer devotion that's Christ-centered, Trinity-directed, that, that it's compatible with that. And that it works. If it's a private devotion, if it works, if it doesn't work, then go on to something else. Uh, but often don't give up. Try try things. See, because often you'd start off like uh, many people I know starting off the rosary, they uh, cannot get into it at all. But often continuing it, then it really becomes it can really become something uh, for them. And it's uh, then that's not a guarantee. It may not. It may not be uh, your cup of of prayer tea. So that there are all sorts of things. That's of different modes of prayer, different types of prayer that people like, like charismatic prayer, stuff like that. You know, dancing around with all this stuff, arms up in the air. For some people, that's great. Other people, they're, they're just turned off by it. So there are different things for different personalities, different different things. So now it is true that repetition can become merely mechanical and routine, but it can also mean that love is being inscribed on the soul for as long as it continues. It is an intrinsic part of life. We are lucky our hearts don't get tired of constantly beating and our rhythm does not get tired, our, heart, our breathing does not get tired of its rhythm. Rhythm, as I said, plays a fundamental role in human life. It has a calming effect. It allows energy to be used for a considerable length of time without wastage or exhaustion. It's often if you're doing you know, aerobic exercises or hit or yumba or something like that. These uh, uh, 
Tabata, or things, these different exercise things. Well, almost always there's music involved. And sometimes I'm not thrilled about the music, but there's a rhythm, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, according to the to that, to getting along. And it, it makes it easier. And it's true of, of a lot of things. The the rhythm, the rhythm of life, the rhythm of breathing. The rhythm of repetitive prayer enables a desire, an intention, to be expressed externally through the body, and at the same time to take root in the heart. It is an acceptance of reality, of the fact of having bodies. I'm going to repeat that. It is an acceptance of a reality, of the fact of having bodies. So Christianity is an incarnational religion. There are forms of it uh, reacting to what they thought was formalism or uh, a too material sort of thing that uh, went off in the other way and just rejected material forms and rejected uh, repeating prayer. Uh, someone I knew of one time in the particular group he grew up in uh, they didn't say the Lord's Prayer because they say, oh, that's that's repetition. So I said, well, it's not vain. It, it's, you know, if you examine that prayer, it, it contains everything. Uh, but anyway, so there, were, so there are traditions that uh, no icons, no anything, no some, uh, you know, it's uh, no, no bodying forth when it comes to this, no gestures, no up and down, standing up, sitting down, uh, let alone prostrating or bowing or crossing yourself or whatever. So they often don't have to just sit there. And, and then for some groups, the silence. Now silence is very, very useful. And uh, it depends on your personality also, the degrees of this. But it, uh, silent times should really be cultivated. And even in liturgy, in the Western liturgy anyway, they have uh, little times, brief times, because people's attention span nowadays seems to be very short. And also, if you're pushed to get everything in it within an hour, you, you, you're not going to have uh, these long things. I remember I went to this mass that was uh, advertised as a contemplative mass. But I said, oh, that usually is just just means there's no music, so that's all. But uh, this one I went to really was. Uh, it was there were long periods of silence. Uh, so it, it was very restful. It was early in the morning, uh, and uh, there were these long periods of silence that were that were good. Now it was a small group of people, and uh, adults. Uh, and, and people who weren't constantly squirming around, making noises, and all of that. Uh, so and it was it was very profound. Because my I prefer mass, you know, sung uh, with the uh, highest church possible thing done, uh, chants and and incense and uh, everything, every possible uh, uh, key played. Uh, in, in this, but other people don't. That's that's not their their thing. And uh, and uh, the traditional mass, uh, that we did, often traditional language and everything. I just find that, and uh, the traditional hymns often I often prefer those because you know some of these things have been around survived a long time. You know Gregorian chant survived not just because it was there, it survived because it worked. It was it survived because it was done well, it's beautiful. And it's adaptable and all that. So, so it survived the you know, 1500 years or longer. And, uh, and so that's beautiful. So in hymns also of these hymns that have survived hundreds of years, uh, and the tunes that went along with them often were for either the beauty of the lyrics or the profundity of the lyrics or the tune, the, uh, the beauty of the tune or the, uh, uh, the moving nature of the tune or the words.
It is an acceptance of reality, of the fact of having bodies. So there were religions that reject the body as a, uh, a trap for the soul, for the spirit. And so anything physical should be eschewed uh, when it comes to the spiritual. But Orthodox Christianity, and by that I mean uh, not just Eastern Orthodoxy, but Catholicism and uh, you know, other forms of, of that emphasize the incarnation, this is not a problem. In fact, the problem is not having this, you know, not having uh, pictures, not having crucifixes, not having incense, not having water, not and all this. And uh, Jesus' ministry was this way. When he gave us the Eucharist, he didn't say, well, just sit there and just shut your eyes and think. No, he used bread and wine to become his very body and blood. And, and you can't get more physical than the summation of the sacraments in the, in the Eucharist. And baptism, he didn't just say, well, just sit there and shut your eyes and, and just image something like that. No, water. Water. Anointing of the sick, again, oil. Touching. Touching involved in all this stuff. So the senses are very important. That's how we get our information through the senses. So there can be infused uh, miraculous gifts of knowledge that can be, but that's not usually the, the mode that's used for that. It's through the senses. Through faith comes through hearing, St. Paul says. So we have to pay attention. We have to sit, see, look with our eyes, and use all this to draw us closer to God, to use art and the, and the like. And, uh, and, and often according to your taste, Whatever your you know your your taste can be, if it's you know black velvet paintings or what this that or or, or uh, the most extreme of of abstract modern art or something that is a, or again even a bare wall with just this little thing on it. That, as I said, that's not my not my cup of tea or, or there um, or my thurible of incense might be better way of saying it. So using all that, using your senses, and even moving, you know, st sitting still, I think, is, is very helpful. But also moving around is very helpful. A walking can be, a rhythmic walking can be uh, a very helpful in prayer. As I said uh, in another class, uh, for me, for a long time, for at least 30 years, running was a big help in prayer. It, it just was a help in meditation, a help in awareness, a help of, in practicing this presence of God. And I miss it. So anyway, eh, that's what happens. So it is an acceptance of reality of the fact of having bodies and that our human condition is part of the rhythms of nature and life. And so praying of the, the the calendar, the liturgical calendar, we should pray that too. Pray with the seasons, the liturgical seasons, as well as praying the natural seasons. It is openness to a deep meaning that surpasses us, going beyond the perception of the rational mind. It gives us access to a sort of wisdom, an intelligence of life, and a dependence on our creator to which we consent. Our prayer is called to become not just one activity among others, but the fundamental activity of our lives, the very rhythm of our deepest existence, the breathing of our heart, so to speak. Repetitive prayers help us achieve this, since they are our human effort, our persevering quest, in the hope that God's grace, so again, it uh, all comes down to God's grace, will grant that for which we ask through our humble, untiring repetition of the same words. 
In a talk on the rosary given at Lourdes in October 1998, Father Timothy Radcliffe, OB, that's Dominican, said, if we love someone, we know that it is not enough to tell them, I love you just once. We will want to say it again and again, and we may hope that they wish to hear it again and again. And that's another thing you can just repeat on your beads. I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Or, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Well, you have the Holy Spirit, yes. But asking for more and more growth in the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And this can be rhythmically, can be chanted, can be done on all sorts of ways. Jesus, I hope in you. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mercy prayer. Uh, Jesus, I trust in you. All of that. Uh, my Jesus, mercy. Uh, uh, or you can, sometimes in other languages, it, it goes more, uh, that you can do it, stuff like that. Jesu caritas. Something, whatever. Jesus is love. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, these, uh, what the uh, Desert Fathers called darts, or uh, that could be thrown out, or, something, or arrows shot out, or these short little things, uh, like that. And it's good when, when your mind is just uh, maybe somewhere else, or your mind is just tired out. It's, it, to think, uh, it, it, the most basic thoughts seem just too tired, let alone the profound, uh, intellectual meditations on something. It's, this is just good. God help me. That's the, help! 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 And it's, it's all sorts of, of things that can be good. I just tell them I love you just once. We want to say it again and again, and we may hope that they wish to hear it again and again. G.K. Chesterton argued that repetition is a characteristic of the vitality of children, who like the same stories, with the same words, time and time again, not because they are bored and unimaginative, but because they delight in life. Chesterton wrote, because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity, that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes each daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. That is in mind, in spirit, ever young. The repetition in nature, with the capital N, may not be merely recurrence. It may be a theatrical encore. Heaven may encore the bird who laid an egg from his book, Orthodoxy, Chapter 4. G.K. Chesterton, the uh, master of many of the one-liners, uh, theological one-liners. There is nothing in the least wrong with spending our time in prayer on these repetitive prayers, especially at moments of tiredness, difficulty in mobilizing our intellectual faculties. Or else, when we feel impelled by the Holy Spirit toward a prayer that, in comparison with meditation, is poorer, simpler, brought back to essentials, not relying too much on intellectual discourse or the work of imagination but favoring the work of the heart. So, because uh, well, sometimes we can get caught up in our own activity of prayer, as if prayer isn't primarily an activity of God, a gift of God. 
And so, uh, so I have to churn this up. I have to churn. And, and some people do, do that, you know, they have to churn up emotions. And so if they don't get the right emotion at this time, they feel the prayer was a failure. No. Often, it, persistence in prayer when it's the driest is often the most dedicated prayer. I think they're going to wear this couch out by banging it. But so far, no. But favoring the work of the heart. This repetition should be done gently, peacefully, without its becoming forced or requiring an effort, which could be counterproductive. We should be attentive to God's presence in us, while gently merging body and spirit with the form of prayer used. The rhythm of the repetition can favor our entering into a state of recollection, being faithful to the humble but sincere search for God expressed in this prayer can give us, little by little, the grace to enter into a state of true contemplation and loving union with God. So these modes of prayer are, are, are channels of grace in that, because remember it all begins with grace, sustained by grace, it is completed by grace, not by our own. It's not our own effort, really, that's, the, the main thing here. The advantage of these repetitive prayers, besides this simplicity, is that they can progressively become a sort of habit in the good sense of the word. So there are good habits and there are bad habits. So we should cultivate the good habits. That makes them a valuable resource for praying at many other moments of the day besides the time devoted to prayer properly so called. It may be when we are in the car walking during times of insomnia while engaged in activities or jobs that do not take up the whole of our mind, etc. Now some reflections on the Jesus prayer and the rosary. So we'll go on to number 10 on page 132 next week, next Wednesday. Well, thank you very much. And let's say the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And another repetitive prayer of, of liturgical prayers that are uh, the, the Kyrie, Kyrie eleison, singing that, the Gregorian tones or other things uh, that can be very helpful. Uh, also, the Byzantine tones for the Kyrie eleison, they can be really, really helpful too. This Lord have mercy. This one thing like that. Well, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Priscilla Real, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Gwen Davis Von Felt, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Kate O'Neill, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Father Robert Hart, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Henry Ayub, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. So I'll be uh, praying for you, Yara Borham. There we go. God bless you, Henry. Uh, Timothy Mills, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. So have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful life in Jesus Christ. Amen.